So please join me in welcoming Michael and Jack. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, a little bit about ourselves. Uh, I've been doing this for 25 years now, uh, different municipalities, different states, Farmington, Rio Rancho, the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, and the Denver area, and then back home. I grew up in Cuba, just over the hill, went to school there, graduated from Eastern University here locally, and uh, Two more classes away from my master's in education. Uh, Jeff? Um, I've been in uh, LAFD for 17 years. I've been the fire marshal for three and a half years. Um, I got uh, a degree from UNMLA, and um, not, much, not much else to say. I'm here. <laughs> so uh, this is... We won't answer any questions. It's just, we're gonna just tell you what, we, I'm joking. We will, it's, it's, it, it will be a question and answer. We, we wanna hear what you want to know about. We'll, we'll give you just a brief overview of what we do and what different areas we cover and how our jobs are interlinked. Uh, this is the code for commercial that I go by. Jeff goes by his other code. So there's two codes that we, that are tied together but different. Okay? Uh, the residential code has another book just like this but has different requirements. A lot of this has F's in here for fire code. I just opened it up. Right in here is the whole F's. In. There's chapter after chapter after chapter that say, hey, work with the fire department on this because you both have things that merge here. Um, so we are seen a lot together uh, because we don't want to show up at a business and say, okay, I'm, I'm requiring this, then Jeff show up later, I'm requiring this, and it's better if we just show up and say we're just re requiring this or this is what we can do to help. We are here to help. Unfortunately, sometimes we're brought in on the backside of when a project's already started or somebody's moved in, and then we're having to try to enforce some of the codes. Um, the codes do deal with, let, let me kind of clarify some stuff. Planning has uses for different places in the county. They don't regulate what we do, we have different uses. We have different requirements. They're gonna say, you can do a office building here, you can do a residential, or you can't do a storage unit, or you know, however it is. Our book covers all of that, but it tells you how you're gonna build the structure. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's where, where we're at. I'm gonna, what I do in my area is we do business licenses, so any new businesses coming in, we renew them or we'll do contractor's business licenses or a new business coming in, we'll review that. Jeff and I both review that uh, and also planning. Uh, building, we have two inspectors. I oversee uh, their commercial and residential. We do not do electrical, plumbing, or mechanical. The state does. We only do building. And we also do, I also do code enforcement, residential and commercial. So we basically have, and permit techs. We have three different divisions, you could say. They're not divisions, it's under one division, but three different functions. And uh, they're all kind of tied together. How does code enforcement work with building inspections? Uh, currently, right now, I have a bill, uh, code enforcement officer that's also a state certified building inspector. So when we're in need, like I was for about a month and a half, two months, uh, I used him when I needed it. Uh, when I couldn't get out, when I had prior meetings, I had him go out and do inspections. Our goal is uh, probably for about four months now, I've had the other uh, code enforcement officer training to be a building inspector. and it, to be a building inspector, you have to get IC, uh, uh, internationally certified, 
and then you have to get state certified. All these require tests and knowledge, so it, it, it's not an easy thing to become an inspector. So, Jeff, and I've been. No, I, I think you've covered a lot. Um, you know, my job is is similar to Michael's on. on you know, every time we look at a set of plans, uh, whether it's new construction or we're dealing with a code enforcement issue, we're taxed with um, with providing for the safety of, of the visitors of that building, of the inhabitants of that building, and, and basically that's what our focus is. Uh, the code book uh, keeps us on task for that. Um, where, my, where my book is a little different and, and what we do on the fire side is a little bit different is I'm talking more about um, the fire safety features, the sprinkler systems, fire alarms, the way you get out of your building, safely exit, egress, um, these sort of things. But everything, like Michael said, is very intertwined. Um, we, we work very closely on, on how we get to the finished product um, on, on both ends, you know, not just on the building side, but, you know, I know the the code enforcement issue has been a hot topic, obviously, and um, and there are a lot of these code enforcement issues that have to do with life safety, and and that is my job is to to create, you know, a safe environment in Los Alamos. So, uh, so when plans come in, when you're starting a new business or you're taking over a business that, let's say, was a office use, you're now turning it into a restaurant. It all comes out of the code and the requirements. We don't make it up. If it's not in here, call us out on it. You know, you can call, you know, I, I'm, it's, it's not in there. Uh, I don't enforce stuff that's not in here or that hasn't been adopted by council. I will only enforce what's in here. We also are kind of stuck on what we enforce because the state adopts the codes that we also have to follow. So it's kind of difficult sometimes for contractors to follow all the different requirements because I've got this book, I've got the Los Alamos code that deals with some changes to this book, and then I've got the state code that deals with changes to that book. So I've got three different places they have to go to. Uh, contractors. Uh, a lot of times that's why it's best to get a uh, design professional that knows that process and, and can go through that. We can typically walk people through it, but it does get a little confusing. Sometimes it gets confusing to me. You know, it's which one, where are we at? Uh, and, and I think it's important to note that oftentimes, more often than not, it's required to get a design professional. It's, it's not even a choice. Um, there are some things that just a um, untrained, uncertified person cannot design. That's true. I mean, there's calculations that, I mean, you know, probably a lot of people here in this county can do. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, there's certain things they need to know before they can do them. Uh, and there's a lot of information in here. And it's ever-changing. Every three years there's a code cycle where they come up with another book that says, all right, this is the new thing we're going to go under, and the state has an advisory committee that makes changes to this. Uh, I've been asked to go to a couple of those meetings. I just unfortunately haven't had the time to go to them. Uh, they vote on the changes that's going to affect the state. We also do the energy code. That's a different code. We do the ADA book, ADA code. That's a different code. Uh, there's, so there's a lot of different things that we have to learn, and staff has to know. Uh, so that we can do our job how we're supposed to do and not over-enforce, uh, but still do the life safety issues. So right now I'll take questions on commercial code enforcement, building, or business licenses. So I want to hear what, what you want me to talk about in the back. So I'm Del Murray with Pictures Lawns. Let me just start by saying I appreciate what you guys do. It Thank really you. It helps us. It helps us keep our residents safe and keep our buildings up to good quality. What we've discovered on our end, we work on the outside of buildings, not the inside. <coughs> we have a lot of competition, and we know that we've worked with code enforcement before, trying to find 
who's licensed in Los Alamos to serve our residents and who's not. We have a lot of unlicensed, kind of under the table businesses that you talk to them and say, oh, I'm just helping a friend. But they're not. They're, and they're undermining small business. They're taking our business and they're putting our community at risk because they're not licensed, they're not trained, they don't know our codes, they go around our systems and they wind up installing a fence over power lines or whatever that they're not supposed to do. So I would like to find ways that we can help our residents become more aware that this is an issue. When you hire somebody to work at your property, you make sure that they're licensed to be there. A lot of time residents will just go with what's the best money option. Of course, the guy who's putting the cash in his pocket is cheaper up front, but they don't realize the risk to themselves and their property if they hire someone, you know, that's not. So I know that we've worked together a little bit reporting some unlicensed businesses. I would like to see better tools for you guys to be able to do your job. You know, if we call in and say, here's the license plate, can you check that? I know license plate are registered through uh, the landfill for the eco station for businesses, so maybe we can get those networks to communicate with each other a bit more, and that will prevent a lot of times when we have confrontations with people who are just going in and stealing business right up out from under the legitimate business, but you can't, you can't stop them unless you confront them, which is a safety Sure. Uh, so th that happens a lot more than you know of here in the county. Uh, I get the investigations from the state for me to do on issues that citizens have here in the county or business owners, uh, unlicensed contractors, uh, roofs that were done bad. Uh, right now I have two investigations going for the state that I have to do on, uh, one's an un unlicensed contractor doing work, no permit. Well, what happens there is they're undermining the person that's doing it the right way, who is getting the licenses, getting, following the procedures and doing it the right way and is accountable. We have other people that are just doing it without permits improper. Well, the, the legitimate business owner is suffering because he's not he's he's charging more because he's doing it the right way. We have other contractors that aren't doing it the right way, aren't taking responsibility, and then when I have to do the investigation on because ultimately there's going to be some problems because the homeowner or the business owner is not going to be happy with what happened. Now I get stuck doing an investigation and actually sometimes red tagging businesses or homes. Uh, I just did a red tag on a house. The homeowner asked me to red tag it because the contractor that they had hired refused to pull the permit. That went to CID. CID sent me an investigation request, so that's currently now under investigation. So we do investigate unlicensed contractors. Business owners do have to be registered through the county also. They may not have to have a state business license. We don't regulate cabinets. We don't regulate flooring. We don't regulate painting. Uh, but if they're a business here in Los Alamos, they still have to get a business license through our uh, department. So I've been told as a follow-up that when the, these unlicensed businesses are doing their business, they're going to the landfill to dump whatever they've been working with. That they don't have to supply their business license if they say I'm from this residence and I'm paying in cash. So that's one of the loopholes that allows these unlicensed businesses <coughs> to continue here in Los Alamos because they they don't have to have any worry about where am I going to dump my stuff. There's no teeth. Well, and and I think one of the issues there is is to not is that they don't want to have people fly dumping in the canyons or anything like that. So if you, if you make things too arduous at the dump, all of a sudden we're going to have canyons full of garbage. Um, and I know, I know that doesn't support 
what you're discussing, and, and I'm sympathetic to your issue. It is very hard to enforce business licenses. It's easier to well, it's easier to enforce someone not paying taxes, right? If they're right. if they're non-taxed, right, then it's a bigger issue. The business registration or license process is a very it's a, it's a very weak statewide, not not just in Los Alamos County. It's a hard thing to, to enforce. However, it is enforceable to a certain degree. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been working on is, especially in, in the places that have storefronts and that are in storefronts, is that we've been working with a property management folks to spread that knowledge. Because a lot of people don't realize they have to get one, right? They might have a tax ID. They might be set up uh, through the state, registered for whatever craft they, they do. And, and don't realize that they have to get a business license. So the best thing we, we can do overall is to educate and, and get that out there. Um, and, I, and, I, and I hope you don't think that I'm arguing your point with the landfill issue. I see how that loophole works, and I, and I think it can be at least somewhat closed if we, if, you know, the, the problem would be that waste would have to be identified as commercial. And it's hard to do that sure, sometimes, depending it's on what a you're doing. Difficult, sticky situation. Yeah. And you want to have people using the landfill instead of again, if we have a lot of real estate. Sure. There's no way we can have our eyes everywhere. Sure. Yeah. And 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 to talk about the license plates, uh, right now the police department, through code enforcement, we're asking to run some plates. Uh, they can't run them all the plates because they have some rules they have to follow and so they have given me another mechanism for where I can do it but I still haven't put that in place uh, it does cost some money uh, I think it's like a thousand I don't know if it's a thousand I think it's a hundred a month to use that program and then it's per plate I run they charge me so I haven't implemented that yet uh, still trying to see how that's going to work and and uh, I'm working with PD on, you know, doing it the proper way. So uh, we're working on that. Uh, I can, there is a lot of illegal dumping <coughs> happening at the dump. Uh, just recently there was some asbestos tile that was sent over there. I got called out on it and, and was, sorry, was asked, you know, Michael, go do an investigation. There's asbestos tile being put in here. There's a remodel going on. Well, I sent one of my inspectors out there. It was tile, but that was it. It wasn't a remodel that was happening. But the, uh, they did see that it was asbestos tiles. Just because I don't require that permit because it's not under my purview doesn't mean that you could dump asbestos at the dump. So they did, I believe, contact the person because they knew who did it and charged them to get that remediated and taken to a place that does collect the asbestos stuff. So just because I don't require some asbestos uh, remediation doesn't mean that you don't have to do it. I don't require it on residential because I'm following kind of the state guidelines and on commercial if it's after a certain year uh, we have the policies up, if anybody would like it, on our webpage on the requirements or if it's under a certain square footage of uh, walls that you're messing with, if that makes any sense. So just because I don't require it doesn't mean you're not going to get stopped at the dump and they're going to require it because if they do accept asbestos material, the, they can get fined. The county can get big fines for accepting that into our landfill. Any other questions? The people can get sick, too. That's a, yes. I mean, the, the workers, the uh, people at the landfill, so people surrounding the landfill. So it, it does affect other people. You had another question. Sorry, and then I'll come back. Go ahead. Um, so now we're not talking residential, but um, say in a mixed-use development, do then both of those books apply, the residential and commercial, or does the commercial actually have codes in it? So yes, the the IBC is what you'd use a commercial code because you're 
ultimately going to require separation and sprinkler systems. So because you have a, if you, if you have a business down at the bottom and then you have residents up above, yes, that's mixed use. And, and it is covered in here, uh, separations, egress, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens. So uh, if it's just residential, like on Canyon, there's some uh, townhomes, three townhomes put together. That comes out of the IRC. You can actually build it out of either code. This one's more restrictive. Uh, the IRC, the uh, legislation passed the law that we can't require sprinkler systems, sorry, Jeff, uh, on certain single family. But when they're stuck like that, we can, because now you're affecting the, the neighbor and the other neighbor. Uh, so we got to protect, basically, there's uh, imaginary property lines, and from there, we got to protect everybody on the property. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, Terry Salazar, um, <coughs> I manage Central Park Square, um, where the urgent care property is, um, <coughs> and a licensed realtor in two states. So my question was, uh, first I want to say thank you for, you know, getting San Fe Imaging <coughs> into the location and moving that along very well. We had some good meetings on that. Mm -hmm. That's moving along well, I see. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And and uh, the next thing is, you said that in the past you hadn't asked for asbestos uh, reports or anything like that if in, in the history of doing a remodel, but are you going to require that now <coughs> at this point on for every remodel? Uh, well, for residential, no. Commercial, commercial. yeah, commercial, they had, they had required that prior to me coming here. Yes, so my predecessor, uh, it, it, it does. Uh, you get that report, you get it scheduled, you get the estimate. We, we realize it does. Uh, but the lasting effects on, on the people who are removing that, yeah. and then again, it's hard to detect it before right. you take it to the dump, and then all those folks that are working out there, county employees, uh, people who are visiting, you know. Uh, using the facility as well. That's who we're looking out for. We're looking out for everyone in between. Michael and I and our <laughs> staff who have to go in there and inspect when there's asbestos free in the air and they're not wearing breathing protection. Yeah. It, it can be a daunting issue and, and we realize that, but there's, no, there's really no alternative to providing for the safety of all those people. That, that, I, that we know of, but we're open for, to the idea. And um, I remember it being a requirement for being put in for the permit in the past, saying, read your asbestos report. So I, I ran a, I checked, and, and there's asbestos reports going on back that have been provided. Maybe the contractor did it, I don't know. You know mm -hmm. Well, contract. yeah, so I can't, I can't speak to it. And the language kind of speaks to some of the buildings that we know were built without asbestos because they were built after a certain time and were permitted. Yeah. We haven't required those in the past. Oh, so, that would make sense. right, because we know and we don't want to have to put that extra, um, you know, burden, quote unquote, on someone who, who wouldn't have that issue. And I think you know, it's 1995. Building, yeah. I, I think it's where we put that timeline. Built a commercial. I believe it's 1995, anything built after that, we're not requiring it. We're hoping that no asbestos was put into that building. Does that mean there isn't asbestos in that building? Because the tiles are still, that had it are still being used. There's still some product out there that still has it that's being used. But we put a line at 95. Uh, we figured. And there, and there could, you know, there could be a chance that after 95, asbestos was brought in, unpermitted, but you can also wear a life jacket in the shower and still drown. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm, I'm curious where the Ben Brentos fall in this spectrum of commercial versus private, mm -hmm. as far as codes. 
So the bed and breakfast would fall under the commercial code because you're inviting the public, the public into basically a, a hotel. Uh, uh, but it has different requirements. It's not as strict uh, in my code. In, I, in I some ways, it's, for the fire code, it's extremely strict because people who are sleeping in, and that's mind-altering area and are not familiar with their surroundings, it, that's the most dangerous situation for people to be in. So um, making the exiting requirements, and, and now... Um, New, new dorming facilities have to be sprinklered. Um, not, not existing, per se, but... Not existing, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but, right, whereas, you know, on the building code side, it is a residential structure, so it's going to say that way, so that it's not gonna, it's not gonna be an issue for Michael as much, but on my side, anywhere where you're, you're gonna be sleeping and you're unfamiliar with your surroundings does create an issue for for exiting and all these sorts of things. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. First back there and I'll get back to you. Okay. So, um, you know, if you see something, for example, if there's somebody who's eating asbestos and there's a 40 mile an hour wind that day and we're outside and stuff, you know, who do you report that to? Do you call your office? Or? So <laughs> there, there's two agencies that can, can do something about it. The state environmental department can investigate it and Unfortunately, would levy some pretty stiff fines. Uh, call us, and we can show up and then see what's going on, and then require it if it falls under the requirements older than that date and over a certain square footage. So there's two entities that can handle it. And if it's the weekend or something along those lines, you can call dispatch, and because at that point it's a safety issue, and we need to cordon off the area. We need to stop. <laughs> the source, if ever we can. We have the folks that we have class A and class B hazmat suits where we can go in and help try to, to mitigate the issue before it, it becomes. And, and I'm available if I'm in town on the weekends. I, I mean, I'm salary, so it, if I'm in town, I'll, I'll respond. So, yes, sir. Always on the clock. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jeff, I have a question for you. Um, sure. Can you talk about fire, smoke, carbon detection systems, processes that, um, that you have part of your code engaged? And then what, um, second part of that would be is, you know, is there, like you talked about asbestos and everything from 95 forward, is there some year in there as far as when the building was built? Um, if there are certain things grandfathered, certain things that aren't required on those buildings that are now required, that type of thing? So, so we're going to answer it. Two different answers, I think, sure. probably the same way, but because we have different codes. So okay. we'll let Jeff go first, and then I'll go second on that. Yeah, so grandfathering is a, a word we, Michael and I, hear every day, and um, yeah. it's, For lack of better terms. right, it's often misused, uh -huh. but, but there are a lot of grandfathering issues, and I want to, and remind me, because you had a kind of a two-part question, right. um, I'm going to start at the end of it. My code, um, the structure of it, has different occupancy classifications. For example, assembly, business, healthcare, you know, one and two family dwellings. It goes down, and, and this is this. It's all broken down into chapters, and you go. You start with the occupancy, and then you go now, and then every one of those subsects has a new and existing code. So for the most part. It, Grandfathering doesn't really exist because we're addressing old issues, right? Um, we're, we're learning issues from, in, in this book, from 9-11, from the station nightclub fire in Rhode Island that killed 100 people in, in the early 2000s, you know, uh, from the Vegas and MGM, the MGM fire in Vegas and stuff like that. So it has to kind of drag along the existing structures as well as, you know, but it's always gonna be more stringent for the new, for the newer type of that building, a new assembly, a new business, a new, however it be, but it's always gonna bring a lot, for, for example, if you have a nightclub environment, you're serving alcohol, having music, because of the station nightclub fire, now, if you have 
an occupancy over 50 in that sort of environment, you've got to have a sprinkler system. Whereas that threshold used to be 300. But because of that one event. But it also says that an existing building uh, that fits that nightclub environment, the threshold is 100 um, occupant load that brings on sprinklers. So it, it brought the existing along with it. Does that help answer that part of the question? So I'm going to do a little bit now on that question too. So this code also deals with sprinkler systems and the requirements and egress and all the stuff that he's talking about. We don't call it grandfathering, we call it legal non-conforming. Meaning it was legal when it was built, it doesn't conform to the rules and regulations that are, we currently have. So if a structure is vacant for a couple of years, the legal non-conforming doesn't apply to it any longer, even if the same use is coming to that building. They now have to bring it up to code. Like the Hilltop House. That, that building sat for long enough and was non-conforming to such a degree that we're making them go through new code processes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, I hope that answered that question. Um, yeah, no, it does. Yeah, just trying to, you know, just trying to see how that goes. And obviously there are a couple of things that have come up in our recent inspection that I'm referring to when Steve came out and there's a couple of things, that, there's a couple of our complexes that I'm questioning and, and trying to get better educated on. So, one, thing, one thing you can always do, um, especially if it's with Steve, with, with my folks, is please, if you have any questions, come talk to me. I'm more than happy to show you where we, how we got to where we're at. Same as Michael said in the beginning, I never enforce anything that is not enforceable. Uh, I, can't, I don't just make up requirements out of thin air. I know sure. the, the liability that puts myself and the county under. And to be honest with you, I have no interest in making things more stringent than they, they need to be. But, um, but you got to also remember when there's fires or somebody dies or something happens with the building, who do they point at? It's either one of us here. It's in the papers everywhere. The building official or the fire marshal didn't do this, didn't do that. Yeah, fortunately, you usually make the newspaper for over-enforcing or under-enforcing the code, but um, they never say anything when you're doing it just right. Um, <laughs> right. That's not news. So, so let me just, so if, if it's a restaurant and a month later you have another restaurant going in there, I'm not going to require anything different. Does that make sense? If it's a business, and it stays a business, and other business moves in, and it just keeps on being a business, we're not going to require anything we, different. We get business licenses every day to approve through our, our Energov um, computer uh, program system, RMS. And we, I would say 90% of them, 95% of them, we don't leave the building. We just look through what they've got on there. We don't have to do a site visit or anything like that. The use is staying the same, or it's, or it's a less stringent use for that area, and we approve it. Now, sometimes we're turning a, you know, a business office, which is one of the most least restrictive. It has, you know, to a much higher risk use. Then we've got to go out and take a look and see that everything is taken care of. And then I know you asked something about like carbon monoxide, and were you asking specifically about? No, just yeah, we were talking about, you know, carbon <clears throat> smoke detection systems. Um, and obviously, I'm talking about the property that we own. Sure. <clears throat> residential. Just residential, multifamily, obviously, 24-unit property. <coughs> um, and the, um, the suggestion, I don't know if it's a suggestion or a mandate yet. <laughs> I'm still waiting to determine that. <coughs> but, uh, of creating a, a, a system that is connected throughout the entire building. Um, and, 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 you know, that there's a possibly a, a new code that this is legal non-conforming currently, and there's a new code that, that we're required to mm -hmm. to do this. So, um, so just overall, is it an existing structure that you're not doing a remodel on, or you are doing a no, remodel on? No, we, we, it's not doing anything. Okay. So then it falls into my hands. Yeah. So you know how to get a hold of me. Let's right. talk, yeah. but let's sit down. Okay. And yeah. and again, and I want to enforce that every time I, um, you know, a little bit. We have a lot going on. Steven Rinaldi is my uh, fire and life safety coordinator. It's just two of, two of us in that division. 
so we can get swamped, but um, I'm always really happy to take time to sit down with people and clarify things. So if there's any other, ever any question about anything that we're doing, we like to hash it out. Sure. So, uh, so please come talk to me or set something up. Sometimes our inspectors that work for us, they might require something that, give us a call. We'll clarify. We'll, we'll make sure that it is requirement that yes, that call was right or no, it wasn't. I have reversed some stuff that my inspectors have done. They didn't do it out of malice or anything, but uh, I have reversed some stuff they've required. It's, not, it's really not that easy, you know, uh, as easy as it looks, because this is just your homepage, and it leads to a library full of books, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, it, just the list of NFPA codes that this refers to and, and this refers to, is that long yeah. and uh, so and mistakes do happen we're not going to sit up here and act infallible we we've made mistakes our staff has made mistakes and and we're willing to own up, own up to them when they come and if someone can show us a different route through the code hey more power to them yeah. and and it's a learning experience for us wow. what i was going to say is for us um as a group we have like 400 apartments all different mm -hmm. styles all different builds, um, and um, in conversation with Steve, I, I'm not sure when, but at some point the county had um, adopted a new portion to the fire code. And so I have researched it, and, and it doesn't appear that there is necessarily non-conforming any longer, right? Yeah. So, so the kind of surprise for us is at our annual inspection, this year was huge list of, well, you're going to have to add sprinkler systems to this building. You need to add another stairwell to this building. You need to, and, and so for us, it was a shock. A little bit. There, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't much preparation to us as far as, hey, this is coming into the works. This is what you should expect. Or, or even like, he didn't have an answer to say like, well, the county adopted this, but you're going to have five years to do this. So as a group, when we sit down and try to budget that and figure out, all right, how do we add a sprinkler system here? And how do we add stairwells here? And how do we add uh, one of the things we well, on the list was uh, carbon monoxide detection, even <coughs> though there's no carbon monoxide producing appliances in each apartment. So then it's like, Okay, how do we get all this done, and what's our time frame? And and at this point, we, we still haven't got an answer to that as far as come talk to me. Frame? Yeah, the best thing right. to do is come talk to me. Um, Stephen is out doing a lot of inspections, and I don't know about all of the details of them. I think I've heard a little bit about this, but anything that's going to be daunting financially. You know, these things have been in existence this way. I have to be reasonable about time frames. And then let's look through, if, if we are challenging the code, let's look through it. And then remember, um, you know, ultimately the final decision is mine, but then there's an appeal process. And I believe in the appeal process, right? If, you've, if, if we're looking at the same page and I'm interpreting it one way and you're interpreting it another, there, there's ways. There's ways to discuss it. And, and again, if someone, if I find out that that is not the way that others are interpreting it, you know, you win. And I'll, hey, thanks for showing me the way. Um, so let's sit down. Let's, yeah. let's all sit down and, and talk and then, um, uh, and we'll see where it's at. And we're gonna make it reasonable. Um, if, if that it is indeed you have these, these big daunting steps in front of you, we're gonna make it a reasonable make time period. And, and, and just correct, there's an appeal process for my interpretations also. Normally when I have a question brought up, I'll look at it, I'll make my interpretation, I'll call ICC for an official code interpretation before I give you an answer, by the way, or before I make a decision. So I'll, I'll get a second opinion and then I'll call other building officials, how are you doing this? And then I'll make that determination based on those three sources. Uh, but it, you can still appeal my decision. Uh, the appeal board can't change 
the code, they can say whether or not I interpreted it correctly or not. And then, you know, we'd, we'd make the change. Yes, sir. You made the comment about building set in so long and then you bring it up to date. So I'm thinking that you haven't mentioned the hilltop house and I'm thinking the new landscape and place out there which went from a restaurant basically, I think, down. It did. It did. So what's, is that a, but I didn't catch, is that a, in the, one of the codes or is that a county thing? Or? No, it's in the, it's in the codes. So after so long of building sets, it has to do something. Correct, uh, and normally we don't we don't uh, actively go after them unless it's a life safety issue. You've heard of the the ones I have down in White Rock. Uh, those are the structural walls are coming apart, and there's gaps between the columns, the twelve by twelve columns that are on there. There's gaps this big where they're going to cause problems. Somebody's going to get hurt. We have, we, we, we ask the owners, you know, either bring them up to code, fix them, or, you know, the alternative was to take them down. They chose to take them down. And in the instance of, I, I did a site visit, and I don't know if, if Michael ever made it over there, but to the Petri Gardens, um, <laughs> I did a site visit and looked through that building. Um, there's been a few interested folks over time, so I've actually visited throughout. And we've kind of, in, with um, uh, Los Alamos Landscape, who, who actually bought the building, I, we, we had discussed with them, we had looked through it, and we had seen what the issues were, right? The Hilltop House, there's a whole different history to it, right? It had a lot of non-conforming issues. It was very scary to us, um, right? So, well, but I, again, I'm, I, I'm just curious, I mean, Say the, the the landscaping thing would be certainly you know the restaurant would be a higher occupancy and, the, 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 and that is correct. So now you're not. That's correct. So we looked at it that way. We we were going from a more hazardous use to a less. So that was easier to do than when it goes from less to more. Well, uh, so, obviously. Yeah. So so we my, did. My question though is, you said there was. So the building says two years. It has to be brought up to a certain code, the code for next use, or for for the next use before that next use goes in. Uh, we had another. So I mean, you, you could, can. So it could be. It could have had. Well, let's say it didn't have. I don't think it had sprinklers in it. I don't remember. You guys know better than I do, obviously. But I mean, yeah, I'm just it does. thinking. You know, because I've you know I've been in it since I was this high. Right? Sure. So, so I would say, even if it, I, yeah, I can understand the structural stuff, but I'm just wondering about, you know, egress and sprinklers. I mean, where's the, where's the cutoff or where? There's, there are a, a, several different thresholds, depending mm -hmm. on what type of occupancy you're using, uh, that would drive a sprinkler system, alarm system, this sort of thing. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's real. Michael and I will not deny a pre-application meeting. We yep. love pre-application meetings. Don't sign a lease. Don't uh, hire an architect. You don't have to do all that stuff. Now, we can't design the, what you're going to do, but we can tell you simple answers to simple questions like, am I going to need a sprinkler system for this building to do this? That's, or, a, that's a big question. That could be a make or break it depending on you know, how you're operating. We'll take those pre-application pre meetings every day, and we love them because we often get blamed, you know, because we come in later. Well, then we sit there and say, well, no one called us. I, we didn't know about it, you know. Oftentimes, we're finding out these places after they've opened. They haven't gotten a business license. They haven't, they've done work on the place without a permit. And we come in and say, well, yeah, let's, let's back this so up a little bit. It's done on almost a case-case basis, though. It is. Yes. It is. Def definitely. Right. Definitely. Well, I didn't there, there are, right, there are a lot of variables. You can't say, okay, this building was built in 1996. Right. Used up to 2015, and it sat empty. 
Right. It, it, right. And, it, and it may be okay, you know, the, the, it might meet all the requirements, and it may not need anything. But like the hilltop, that has a lot of requirements that it has to meet, because the way it was done doesn't meet a whole lot of life safety issues under either code. So we have to make sure that people using that facility are safe. We, a building has the right to be vacant and retain its certificate of occupancy. And then Michael has the right to have a vacant building that is non-code conforming, um, have its certificate of occupancy revoked. And we have to start somewhat from new just to create a safer environment yeah, for its visitors. I think, yeah, because I think that's a, well, I, I think it goes back to, I don't think there's a, a person in this room or in the community that you know, wants to have a risk of a safety issue, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, they just say, if you take a building that was fine five years ago, and even though it's for whatever reason, right, because we all know that the retail end in this town is really hurting, and now all of a sudden, you know, we're going to put a retail store in here where everybody's going to jump up and down, and I want to rent it that way, and it's basically what it was five years ago, then there shouldn't be, like, you know, like you would assume, Things that would not need a bunch of adjustment well, if you're something close. Well, you know, and, and that could be the case that nothing has to happen. But in some buildings, the maintenance doesn't stay no, up, and absolutely. and so there's roof leaks, and there's other mold in there, and there's other issues. That yes, we're going to make you bring that into life safety uh, compliance. And so and what's happened since the last inspection in general, right? right. That needs to be addressed. So in those instances, yes, we will look well, at that. I think the, the landscape thing is a perfect example. Yeah. You know, you, I'm sure there would have had been more done if it was going to be a restaurant. Correct. You're sure. absolutely right. I mean, they, they chose to put in an e, another door because it was best for them. We didn't require that. Uh, they were doing some other stuff. You know, they, they came to us. We talked about it. We, before they bought it, before they did all this, they, they did meet with us and we did talk about what, okay, this is, you know, this will work and, you know, for what you're using. So we do meet with the with, uh, business owners. We prefer it. Uh, Jeff and I do discuss stuff. Even before we make a decision, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, shoot stuff off of each other, make sure we're in check. And, and not to tug at your heartstrings, but I think that it's important to note that Michael and I both live here and we understand um, mm -hmm. the decisions that we make, the interpretations of the code that we make can affect the economic vitality of this town. And I would tell you, you know, I'm not going to speak for Michael, but I believe he believes this as well. We like to say yes. We mm -hmm. really do. You know, I say no and, and you know, potentially getting uh, into a conflict, conflict with someone. It's not the way I want to go. And it doesn't make my job easier. If someone comes to me with a plan that can work and I can justify it in this code book, I say yes. Now, again, I am the only one on the fire end. I'm the authority having jurisdiction that is looking out for the counties, the fire departments, and my own legal liability. And the code puts enough legal liability on me personally to make sure that I do my job that I can't just say, well, oh, the county will take care of me if I get sued for not doing my job. Remember, and it's, I, it, I think it's important, important to, to note this part of our job. There's several instances going on right now, like the Los Angeles fire marshal lost his job and was personally held liable for not, for not doing his job, for not following the code. Um, you know, there can be public battles about whether we're over enforcing the code or if we're picking on someone or whatever the case may be. But the bigger one will be if someone is hurt or worse because I don't do my job, that's not only a legal issue. I have to live with that for the rest of my life. You know, that I was the only one in town to take care of that and make sure that it happened, that this or that happened with this building and I let it go and now someone, you know, is hurt or worse that there's a big issue there. So it's not, um, you know, it's not something that we take lightly. I well, guess. I, Jeff, I, you know, I appreciate that. I just, I just, 
You know, I think that needs to be said, though, about, again, everybody in this room. I mean, there's nobody, for the most part... And I'm not saying it in an argumentative you know, manner, know, okay. Was, I mean, there was, the, there was the thing about the CDC, you know, they were whining about you know, some of the signs, right? And, and yet they, they think that the business owners are not in tune to, you know, that kind of issue that someone might get hurt. And uh, I, lack of a better word, it, it's offensive to think that we're, you know, ignoring that. Because first of all, it would raise insurance rates. Mm -hmm. You might end up closing your doors. And like I say, you got to live with it for the rest of your life. So I think it's a team effort. But I agree. It's, it's got to be, again, I guess a reasonable thing, especially simply because Los Angeles has got so many issues, for lack of a better term right now. But uh, I just, I don't think it should be said that everybody's trying to ignore it and everybody's not trying to, and yet the, you know, the county can't sit there and say you can't do that because it was, uh, you know, it's not the way the building was meant to be or whatever. I mean, you know, well, we've got so much invested in this or, you know, there's a lot of money that's sitting there and there's no way you're going to get the county or someone else to come in and buy you out if it's, you know, something you can't fix reasonably or whatever. But, I mean, but I, you know, again, I just want to make sure you, the county knows, which I think is lacking, and I think Harry needs to hear this more than anybody, that, you know, the business owners pay a lot of attention to our own stuff. And sure, I mean, there's always going to be questionable acts, but I don't think that is the norm, nor do I think it is rationally intentional. Um, I think it's just, but I, you know, to say that we're not trying to do that, or it's just one-sided is, you know. Uh, and I don't. Thank you. So, so I think we're getting ready to be wrapped up. We're getting ready. I think there's one more question in the back. Oh, um, just more of a comment. Um, about how this whole process works. I had, wish I had been more proactive. Oh, I'm sorry, my name is Laura Poussette. I have own Pig and Pig Cafe. I'm in the process of uh, moving into new space, which some of you may have read about in the paper. Uh, but um, but I, I wish I had gotten more involved in the process earlier on and reached out to these guys earlier on in the process to be more informed. Um, and so, for any other business owner going through a remodel or a move, I would recommend that you do reach out to these guys personally or to their office and do a pre-inspection before you sign a lease, before you commit to a contractor, architect, so on and so forth. Because um, having done several just informal walkthroughs of the property and seeing how they work, it's it has to be a common sense. There can't there can't be a code written on the county website that covers everything because this is a very unique community. The buildings are very old. They're not particularly well maintained all the time. And so, uh, you know, and I think the looks on their faces when they walk into a property and, and there's so much to fix here, I don't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. And so that it looks like they're walking a fine line. And, and there's also sort of an artistic safety element to what they do. Like, well, under these circumstances, this might be okay but this is never going to be okay. And, um, and you know, working with me, they've been open, receptive, positive, encouraging, and most of all, they're just coming from a common sense place. And so um, I encourage you guys to reach out to them if you ever have any issues because they're not out to get anybody or to make anybody's uh, business fail by making, putting all these stringent requirements on them. And so I want to personally thank you both for all your help and support. Um, you know, they, they want businesses to thrive and succeed so that we have the money to fix all the things that are wrong with the buildings in town. <laughs> so, friend, thank you, thank Laura. you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, we appreciate that. And I'd like to echo that. It's like when we opened Ruby K's, 13 years ago, it's like, you don't know what you don't know, and I was interested in opening a business, I wasn't thinking about all these other things, I was thinking about design, decor, food, that sort of thing, yes. and mm -hmm. so I think if I would have had knowledge that 
to go to you guys mm -hmm. before we started, you know. But yeah, and, I, and maybe that's something we can incorporate with your offices as well when businesses are looking to start in this town. And Absolutely, say, good point. Okay, you're looking at property? <laughs> please, please, please have them contact us. Yeah. We, we, we will welcome them and walk them through the steps, and, and we, we prefer that. And it the, creates the, a lot of less trouble down the road. The, yes. ambitious, the ambitious new business owner often spends their last dollar before they come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and then yes. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I hope you have a credit card because yeah. we've got we've got some more things to do, and that makes that shines a bad light on me. Yeah, that's so, Laura. It, please, thank you for that because it is important to come see us as soon as possible to get the most realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then that's a bad guy. All right. You know. One more. Thank you, Laura. Joni. I just had a super quick comment. The county has been listening to the feedback from the business community. And Michael and I and LACDC, we've been working collaboratively through our branding initiative, and we will be standing up a website that will essentially act as a flow chart. So you want to open a business here, you do this, and then who do you contact? Who at the county? And like I said, so we're working with the building department to make sure. Thank you, Joe. So I just want to remind everyone, today's uh, topic was brought up by a chamber member who was having an issue. And they came to the chamber and said, we need some help. And uh, so we brought them out to answer some questions. That's what we're here for. The chamber wants to help you all. If there's anything that you have that you would like to see addressed, please just let me know. Uh, that's how this works. So please join me in thanking Michael and Jeff. Thank you. Nominate businesses for the uh, business awards, Mr. Jolly. And don't forget for the next two or three days to go on uh, uh, America's Main Street contest oh, yeah. and vote for Los Alamos. We're, we're after twenty-five thousand mm dollars -hmm. to spend on on Main Street here, and we've got about two more days in the nominating process. So Excellent. Thank every you day, for every that device you had. So, <laughs> thank, thank you for having us. Yeah. And I have my cards here. If you need my number, call me. Catch up speed dial. <laughs> <laughs>